The notion of quietly quitting is just a silly, silly concept. It's not a great resignation. It's a great awakening. Because over the next 10 years, we're going to be rethinking a lot of the fundamentals. We want skilled people who will support each other and feel a commitment to the outcome. If you're a company and you're thinking about freelancers, there are six things that you need to do very, very well. Let's take a look at how ready we are for the future. Hi everyone, this is David, Managing Director of Expert Powerhouse. At Expert Powerhouse, we are helping the most renowned consulting firms as well as far more than 100 industry clients with on-demand consultants and experts for their projects. I'm really excited to moderate my first LinkedIn Live talk today. This is the second episode of our monthly Expert Powerhouse talk series. And today we want to talk about nothing less than the future of work. We are witnessing tough times. Many employees have been laid off recently. This is avoidable by finding a new blended resourcing approach. Why? While laying off large parts of the workforce is more or less a short-term reaction concerning cost and uncertainty. But it's not very creative, not very far-sighted, is it? Companies can avoid such reactions if they opt in for the future of resourcing. Therefore, we want to discuss a more creative approach to this problem. We want to discuss the future of work, the future of staffing. We have invited a guest today who is a a sought-after speaker and author on this topic. He wrote many books in the field, including The Agile Talent, and he regularly pub publishes articles on Forbes, Harvard Business Review, and other renowned media. He also became a dear friend and mentor of Expert Powerhouse. I'm excited to speak today with Dr. Jon Younger. Hello. Hi, John. Welcome to the Expert Powerhouse talk. How are you Thank today you and where are you at? You know, first of all, thank you so much. You are so kind. I think of you guys as my mentors and rabbis as well. So thank you so much. The Expert Powerhouse was one of the very first platforms that I met way back when. I'm here at a very interesting place. I'm here at the Laboratory for Innovation Sciences at Harvard University. I'm part of a group that's meeting and talking exactly about what we're going to talk about today, which is the future of work. And it's a pleasure to be among young students who have their eyes wide open, their ears wide open, no interest in not considering all of the possibilities of the future. What a great place in which to have this conversation with you. Let us directly dive into the topic, John. You're also witnessing those massive job cuts that major tech yes. companies have announced. Some are even going into a second round of layoffs. Is that avoidable? Sure it is. Uh, it, it's not avoidable now because they have staffed in a way that is inconsistent with their view of where things are moving. But may I tell you a story if, if I can? I wrote a little bit of a, I guess it was a LinkedIn post and talked about some reasons why you would be interested in freelancing. And somebody responded from Denmark and said, this is really great. Somebody else responded and said, yes, but we need full-time people. What I want to invite our viewers to consider is that that's the wrong answer to the question. It's not that I need full-time people. It's that I need great talent available when I need them for the skill set that I require in order for my business, my agency, my organization to be successful. If we will start with the skill set, Instead of the role, if I may put it that way, that is a great first step. And may I give you, David, just one example of an organization or a kind of work, rather, uh, that challenges the notion of, gee whiz, if we don't have enough full-time people, it'll be problematic. Think about your favorite movie. The chances are pretty strong that your favorite movie was done by a group of freelancers and a group of agencies that were joined together for the course of that project. A dear friend of mine is a producer of movies, and 
I had asked the question, tell me about who was involved in the last of, of your movies. And she said, 83 different organizations contributed. Some of those organizations were an organization of one, some of them were an organization of many, but all came together with the right management, namely a producer and a production team that helped them to understand how their work connected with the work of other folks. Well, at the end of the day, isn't that really what we're trying to do? We want skilled people who will support each other and feel a commitment to the outcome. At the end of the day, that's kind of what it is we're trying to do. That doesn't require full-time people, though full-time people may be outstanding as part of that total population that's getting the job done. But they are not a necessity. They're a historical necessity, but not necessarily a, a future necessity, if I may put it that way. I want to surely dive into the more details on those examples, uh, sure. but let's maybe start from the beginning. People, including myself, are confused about what's going on. On the one hand side, we had seen the talent shortage in tech and other areas. We witnessed it that many called a great resignation and people were quietly quitting their jobs. Now we see the, the big layoffs in the industry in many companies, specifically tech companies. And it really sounds like the way we understand and live work is up for change. Can yes. you help us here to put things in order, John? Sure, 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 sure. So, so if, we, if we start with the notion of quietly quitting, there's a wonderful article that, and I'll jump through all three of those, David. I'll do that. I'll go to the resignations, the great awakening, and I'll go to the layoffs next. But they all form part of a package. If I may share with your audience the notion of quietly quitting, which has received a tremendous amount of publicity, is absolutely bunk. I mean, it's just a silly, silly concept. What it tried to do was to take real data, Gallup data, on the degree to which people are engaged in their work and make a clickbait out of it, if I may put it that bluntly. At the end of the day, what we know is that there are certain things that are happening to employees. Let's forget about freelancers for a moment and let's really focus on employees. One of the things that's happening is, is that they are trusting their managers less. And what we know is that people don't leave organizations, they leave managers. Second thing that we know is that COVID has put an extraordinary level of confusion in how we work together and how we're organized. And while people seem to have gotten together pretty well in terms of creating productivity through a remote environment, managers don't like that. They don't like that if they're not good managers because they're not sure how to make certain that people are working on the right things in the right way at the right time for the right time unless they're observing them, unless they're watching them closely. Well, what that means is maybe you're picking the wrong people. Maybe you, you've trained them in the wrong way. Or maybe you're just kind of overly anxious about what they're doing versus giving people the opportunity to work well together. As a result of that, what we know is that about a third of employees are, are excuse me, actually engaged. That is to say, let's define engagement, which is they're willing to give discretionary time to the work. They feel committed to the organization. They're motivated by the work that they're doing in the organization. And they are literally giving the organization a gift of additional time or additional thought. Second dimension is, is there are about 18%, I think, of people who are actively, something like that, actively disengaged. That is to say, they're saboteurs. Not only are they disinterested in the work that they're doing and giving it a sort of a basic touch, but they really don't like their organization and are doing things to get in the way of its performance. In the middle, 50%, and I didn't do the math very well, but it's not bad. In the middle are 50% of employees who are not engaged, but they're not disengaged. That is to say, I will give you what you pay me for. You pay me for eight hours, I will give you those eight hours. You pay me to answer these questions or do this work, I will answer those questions or do this work. But don't ask me for more than that. So you've got a situation where an awful lot of people are kind of saying, 
I'm here for the money. I'm here for the current job, but I'm not excited about this organization or I'm not excited about the job that I'm doing. And there we end up in the great resignation. David, it's not a great resignation. It's a great awakening. It's people saying, I need to take my life back. In the context of, of COVID, we have all thought deeply at one time or another about what we want to do with the rest of our lives, where we want to spend our time. And that's caused an awful lot of people to say, maybe this isn't the right employer for me. Maybe this isn't the right career for me. Maybe I'm doing it in the wrong way, or maybe I'm not living in the right place. But we are seeing people consider their lives at a much deeper level because of COVID than we ever did before. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. And now on top of that, we're seeing layoffs. And we're seeing layoffs for a very simple reason. People are worried, managers, senior managers are worried that as interest rates go up, remember that most of these large tech companies are US based. So we're seeing interest rates go up, we're seeing the value of the currency go up and all of a sudden their products start to be a little less competitive. Even if they're the best products in the world, if the price is twice as high because of the excessive value of the US dollar, those companies are hurt. And so they're asking the question, where can we reduce so that we can, to the extent possible, mediate that hit? And what we're finding is that organizations are making decisions about the less important of their functions and moving some of those folks out. And so, for example, what if you were to listen carefully to the folks at Google who said, we've got to find 20% more productivity. Well, it turns out that 20% is also the amount of time that isn't allocated for a Google technical person. We know that 10% is projects of your own doing, and we know that 70% is your regular work. 20% wasn't ever quite identified, and it was for sort of new developments, et cetera, et cetera. What they're doing is pulling that out. And that, that ends up feeling like a layoff. But remember, it's a much more, in tech terms, it's a much more focused layoff in terms of the kinds of skills that they're moving out. Let me add one piece to that, David, and that is to say, and I know you're going to ask me this in a bit, but let me pre-say it by saying, the problem with freelancing is it's lumpy. 60, 62% of freelancers in our survey made as much or more money and were as or more satisfied than their full-time uh, alternatives and better than they had done in the past. But remember what constitutes that 60%. A, there's a dimension of, of how skilled you are, what, what's the level of experience that you've had and your level of expertise. But there's also the horizontal level of what category of work are you involved in. We know right now that if you're in AI, you're in robotics, you're in data science, you're doing pretty good. But if you're in other areas of tech, it may not be as attractive right now for you and you may not be as critical for the organization right now, and you may lose your job that way. We also know that folks in the marketing kinds of areas, the agency disruption sorts of areas, and in the consulting field, your field is getting a little tighter as well, because we, we know that consulting is very expensive. We also know it's very important. And so we're focusing that consulting in areas that are important to the company or important to the industry. So right now, for example, you're getting a, a ton of work, a lot of interest in the area of transformation, not just digital transformation, but marketing or strategic transformation, operational transformation, where people are saying, I built my business for the last generation. Now I need to change it for the next generation. Expert powerhouse, can you help me? And, and so you see in that area, it becomes terribly important as well. So keep in mind as a summary of that point, a, that quietly quitting is nonsense. 50% of people are not quietly quitting. They're just not giving their organization more than their organization is paying for. Second, it is not a great resignation. 
It's a great awakening. That doesn't cause everybody to leave their organization because we know that many people are returning to big companies, et cetera. But it does mean that people are getting a lot clearer about what they want, what they need, and how they want to live. And in the area of layoffs, what we're finding is that if you are critical to the enterprise's strategy, if you're important to its customers, you're going to keep your job. But if you're doing stuff that's marginal to the business of the organization or marginal to the way it creates value, you're likely to be under a bit more concern for obvious reasons. The big question here, John, would be, can companies that build and that are structured for freelancers, can they benefit in those times? Indeed, indeed. Of course they can. And you and I both know as former consultants, we had our best work, we had our best years when economies were confused and heading down. Best time to do consulting work. So I think you're going to see a tremendous amount of that. I, I think the other thing that, that comes along with the opportunity for freelancers to do more work is organizations really rethinking how they're structured, how they're resourced what their tolerance is for hybrid versus remote work. And all of those have implications and consequences. So I truly believe over the next 10 years, we're going to be doing an awful lot of thinking ourselves, our clients, our government agencies that are supporting work in various ways. We're going to be rethinking a lot of the fundamentals of what what we believed was essential about a good organization, a well-resourced organization, a well-managed organization. There's a mm -hmm. lot of change happening and it's very exciting or really scary, depending on your point of view. And if we say that the future of work, and that is what I hear kind of as well from what you say, is governed really by a higher degree of flexible workers, freelancers yeah. in your workforce, as part of your workforce, what is the benchmark? Do you have... There are companies that do it specifically well. What is needed to do it specifically well? You know, there, there are six things. If you're a company and you're thinking about freelancers, there are six things that you need to do very, very well. First thing is you need a point of view on how you're going to use freelancers in the future. Some of those organizations only use them on demand and only for very specific kinds of work. Other organizations use them much more fulsomely uh, and they see it as a supplementary workforce. And there are a few organizations that say, we really don't need very many full-time people. We really can work with a very small core of full-timers and a very large population of freelancers. So you, you can imagine those three categories. And one of the things, if I may give an example, Unilever did a very nice job of really thinking through how it was going to use freelancers in the future and what kind of workforce it was going to build over the next 10 years. So that's first. Second, a company that uses freelancers very well is a company that does a good job of performance management. You know, their employees don't like performance management. Nobody likes to be evaluated if you're an employee. I mean, it's just not fun. But if you're a freelancer, you want to be evaluated because it's absolutely critical to your future. You want to know where you're strong. You want to know where you're weak. You want to know whether they love you or whether they hate you. They need to know what areas they think you need to improve because that's how you get the next job. That's how you build your career. Third thing is it's really very important that, that we be clear about those areas where freelancers can't contribute. For example, there may be conflicts of information. There may be conflicts of schedule if I'm not able to participate. There may be conflicts of knowledge management or any number of areas where you can't know this stuff. It's super secret. Fourth, very important that you teach managers how to work with freelancers. They're not the same <laughs> as employees. But if you're a young project manager, you kind of want to see the, the whole team as subordinate to you. Freelancers are not subordinate any more than if you go in to buy a bottle of water at a bodega, you think the man on the other side of the counter that's selling it to you 
is somehow subordinate to you. It's an exchange. And one of the things that freelancers expect from organizations they work with is that they'll be treated with the respect and independence that you can that you understand is true about this individual who is picked for his or her skill set to work on a project for a particular point in time. One of the things that becomes really important, for example, is the frequency of feedback, conversation. Often, David, free freelancers need feedback because they want to do better, they want to do well, and managers don't give them as much time or effort because they want to give that effort to their full-time people. That's a problem. Fifth, two more. As long as they're on your team, treat them as a team member. Don't treat them as somebody with a disease that you can't get too close to, that you have to wear a mask around. <laughs> think about, I know that sounds silly, but think about how many freelancers aren't allowed in the company cafeteria, are not allowed to the training meetings, are not allowed to the communication meetings, but in fact have the same requirements that anybody else does working on a project. So while you are employing them as a project freelancer, treat them like somebody that really is part of your culture, part of your team, part of your organization. And then last, but by no means least, treat them with respect and pay them fairly and on time. I will tell you one story, if I may, and this is ancient history. I was, as you are, a consultant. And so I was doing a project for a company called Dow Chemical. Dow Chemical is a very large chemical company. And they had gone through a hard time. And I think this was, I don't know, maybe it was 1990 or something like that. But it was a very difficult economic period. And so they made the decision, David, that they were going to pay invoices after receipt at 90 days. Let me explain what that means if anybody in the audience doesn't understand that. That means that, that it takes 30 days for them to decide it's a, it's a reasonable invoice, it's correct, and then they have 90 days to pay it, which means that you get paid once every four months. I, I left the project. I sat down with our client and I said, I can't be your bank. I'm sorry. <laughs> And so I'm going to leave the project. He said, well, what do you mean you'll leave the project? We have to finish the project. And I said, yes, but I need to be paid fairly. And, and it was one of those situations where they didn't realize they were taking advantage of me because in their mind, they were just protecting their asset base. And, and what they didn't understand was that for part of the time that I was working on a project that they considered important, David, I was part of their asset base. And they needed to understand that as well, that your assets are not just the stuff that you own. The assets are the folks that are working hard as freelancers to make you successful. So those six things, clear philosophy, excellent performance management, starting with onboarding, teaching managers how to work with freelancers, treating them like team members, organization members of the tribe while you're, while you're in the work, being clear about what work you don't give them because of conflicts, and then finally treating them with respect and paying them fairly. You know, if you were to do that, you would have access to any freelancer in the world and people would want to work with you. And by the way, David, is this really that different from what we're asking employees? Those are the same six things that would kind of be useful for anybody. It's just that freelancers require them in, in a different way. Yeah, it's a great summary of how to work with freelancers, maybe. And you touched upon that as well, but maybe you can also give your top three benefits for a company to opt to work with freelancers. Sure, to absolutely. Use a flexible workforce more. More absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I started at Exxon and Exxon was a fabulous organization. I was an Exxon employee and then an Exxon manager and then an executive over a 10 year career with Exxon. Fabulous experience. And freelancers don't want to work for Exxon. Many employees don't want to work for Exxon anymore. They think that, first of all, they think it's, it's the wrong industry, right? Second, They think it's old fashioned. Third, if you're on the tech side, there's a feeling that, well, 
you know, it's kind of interesting tech, but it's not really the tech that I'm interested in. So part of the, one of the challenges is if you weren't going to use freelancers, could you attract the talent you need? What I know is that as a freelancer, I'm very interested in working with Exxon, but as a full-time employee over the course of a career, not so much. So the first thing that the freelancing can give an organization is access to folks that they would not have access to otherwise. Second is time, and the third is cost. So let's talk about time. I think that the expectation these days is something like a month of recruiting for every 20 to 25,000 euros in salary. So if I'm looking for somebody that's, that's a 125,000 euros, which is not unreasonable if I'm a strong technology person or if I'm a strong consulting person, person with consulting expertise moving in the organization. Well, that's five months. I needed the person next week. I needed the person, you know, in two weeks. At my meeting right now is one of the platforms, Torque. Torque is a wonderful high-tech platform. I know those guys, they're very good. And the answer is they can they can at least identify talent that is available to you at the level that you require, at the cost that you require within 48 hours. Now, it may take a week before everything is set up on your side and you can bring them in. That's a very different message than five months and hoping. Third is cost. And, and cost is a big deal. The fact of the matter is that more and more organizations don't need this skill set full time. Why am I paying full time for a skill set that I need half time or a skill set that I need quarter time or a skill set that I need for a month? The consequence of hiring an individual whose skill set is needed variably rather than on ongoing is that talent isn't happy, you're not happy, and the chances are it's going to end badly. So if you sort of think about those, those three factors, right? One is accessibility. Second is time. Third is cost. Let me add one more, and that is your ability to identify talent through freelancing that you may not be aware of, that you could not get to in terms of your advertising or your efforts to recruit. It, it's a discovery process. If I use the example of it, let me use the example of, let me use Turing. It's a big example. Turing.com is primarily tech. They have 1.5 million people on their platform. So that the chances of them being able to surface a technical talent that you don't know about but would be perfect for your organization, but not interested full-time, is interested in the project, that's the fourth benefit. And that's as real a benefit in consulting and expert networks as it is anywhere else in tech, in marketing, et cetera, et cetera. You're able, as expert powerhouse, to put together a candidate slate for a project that meets the set of roles, the set of standards, the set of experiences, and maybe even the set of organizations that the person has worked with or worked for. So it's much more, you're much more able to pinpoint the talent that's required as a freelance provider than you would be able to if you were a company looking for that individual. For very good reasons. Yes. John, can you also share two to three tips for our community of how... Sure. To assess if I am as a company state of the art when it comes to flexible work and the future of work, where do I start? You know, it's a, it's a wonderful question. And the first place we start is with our assumptions. You know, it, even before we get to, and David, I will leave the consulting methodology to experts like you and Christian and many of the people on your platform. So let me talk for a moment if I can in my earlier career as a social psychologist. And that is, I used to teach at University of Michigan and some other places as well. And one of the things that we know is that 
assumptions get in our way. So one of the assumptions that an organization very often makes is freelancers aren't loyal. Well, that is a very interesting statement. Loyal in what sense? Loyal to the project? Of course they are. Loyal to the outcome? Of course they are. Isn't that what you're looking for? Do you need an additional level of loyalty? What are we talking about? Other companies have the shibboleth that if you were really good, you'd have a full-time job. Well, what we know is that that is simply not true, that more and more people are thinking about or acting on the opportunities in freelancing. 87% people in a recent survey said, I would consider full-time freelancing, but for three concerns. One is income volatility. I'm afraid that I'll make less or that it would be too wavy. Second is I fear losing some of the benefits like paid vacation or education. And third, I'm worried about being lonely. Those are the three issues that, that get in the way of people making the, the decision. When we think about those kinds of things and add them together with our assumptions about freelancers, our first step is to really chest those assumptions. So the place that I would start, David, is I'd start with a guy like you and I'd say, can you connect me with three or four of your clients that are well advanced in using freelancers? And then would you connect me with three or four of your clients that are kind of just getting into it? We'd be very interested in understanding what that would look like. Uh, talking with those folks ends up being really important. David, what we know is that all the stats in the world are not as compelling as the uh, experience of your neighbor. <laughs> and so we want to start with that. The second thing that I would do if you were to invite me is I would hire Expert Powerhouse to do the following. Now, I would hire Expert Powerhouse to bring together a few of my HR people, my best people, a few of my purchasing people, my best people, a few of my managers, best people, and a few of the people that understand the market. So I'd, I'd have external facing folks, either in marketing or sales. And I would ask them the following question. How prepared is our workforce for the changes that we perceive in our market and our economy and our world over the next five to 10 years? What percentage of our workforce is using tools that won't be relevant in 10 years? Have backgrounds or experiences or skill sets that won't be relevant in five to 10 years? Where will we be if we just extend what we're doing out 10 years? And what sorts of threats and challenges will that create for us? That's a wonderful way to sort of think about from an organizational point of view, how you might get started. And, and then the third reason why that becomes very important is that you're not pushing this on the organization. You know, one of the things that employees worry about is that I'm going to be replaced by, you know, it used to be I'm going to be replaced by a robot, right? Now it's I'm going to be replaced by a freelancer. Well, Something happens when the organization itself identifies the need for a different workforce architecture than when it's pushed from the top as a former McKinsey or a former BCG or a former Bain kind of, you should do this. When we drill from the bottom up, when we help the organization itself work that stuff out, it has an awful lot more resonance. So first is, Check your assumptions. Really talk about those assumptions. There's a deep psychology here over a thousand years of industrial history. Second step is let's take a look at how ready we are for the future. And let's have our smartest people in those areas that are most relevant to that really help us to understand that. And then let's figure out what sort of workforce we need and what the role of freelancers will be within it. Great. Before we go into the Q&A, and I would invite everyone of the audience who is interested to actually put their questions already in the chat. One last question to you, John. 
what is your personal view on the economic outlook of the next, say, six to 12 months? Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, I think we're in for a ride. I think we're all in for a pretty serious ride. I think there's been so many factors, you know, whether it's the economy, it's the COVID, it's the war in Ukraine, it's the climate issues. Man, oh, man, it takes bigger brains than mine to know how all that is going to come together. What I hope is that we continue to benefit from the requirement that seems to be enforced, which is that we don't kill each other. And if we can really kind of keep that clear, that what we're trying to do is survive as an entire planet, I think we're better off. But David, smarter guys than I am, smarter men and women than I am, are, are people you ought to ask on that last point, because I am I'm lost, but I am optimistic. That's good. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it is very uncertain times for sure. Uh, it's very uncertain. But I'm optimistic. Sure. I am optimistic. That, that, that is good to hear. Yeah. I'm also optimistic. And as you said beforehand, I think it summarizes this also quite well. I think the freelance economy will benefit of it. Uh, totally. So crisis, we have always come out stronger from crisis. Take the pandemic, a lockdown, the first lockdown when everything came to a standstill and when we all benefited heavily from it in the end. You know, I, I want to reinforce just one point that you made. And that is that freelancing isn't new. It's that the industry, the period of the industrial revolution sort of drove us into this notion that our workforce was an extension of our production and therefore needed to be co-located. So whether it was the guilds in the 16th century, it was the mass manufacturing of textiles in England in the 19th century, whatever it was, we were all captive of geography. The technology has made it possible for us no longer to be tactive, captive of geography. And one of the things that happens when that's the case is that we're, our success or failure, our education, our lot in life is no longer an accident of birth. We have disconnected location from possibility. That's for me is so exciting. What we're going to find is, is that there are orders of magnitude, more brilliant and exciting and creative people that will join us in a full way because hopefully they have full bellies. They have access to education. They live in an environment where people want them to be healthy. I'm very excited about that. We've seen extraordinary progress on so many dimensions over the last couple, 300 years. That for me is a kind of given. I'm very excited about meeting the people that are smarter than me in Myanmar because I just forward to it. Excellent, John. We got a couple of questions and I would sure. like to also get to that. Someone is asking, what is a benchmark with regard to having a fair degree of freelancers, flexible oh workers in my workforce? Oh, I can't answer that. And, and I can say that one of the things that you ought to consider is thinking about that on a, initially on a project-to-project -project basis. Thinking about the entire workforce just gives me a headache. But as I think about a, a particular project, it's a lot easier for me to say, I think I need a skill set here. I think I need a skill set there. I think I need a skill set somewhere else. And we don't have that internally. We need it at this point in time for this period. We have this kind of budget. Let's find them. I think that's going to be the easier thing, especially if you're, if you're in HR procurement. It makes such a difference if you're able to think small before you start to think big. Another question is from Razuli is asking, very broad question, I guess. How will work look like in 10 years? Oh, my gosh. Hi, Razul. It's a great question. And I'm as eager to know the answer as you are. <laughs> but, but who knows? Who knows? But Razul, my email is jcyounger at mac.com. It is Wednesday, September 28th. 
2022, please write to me September 28th, 2023 and tell me what's changed in the last year. And I'm going to write with you each year and we'll see what happens, what's changed each year. And then at the end in 2032, we will share what we have learned with the rest of the audience that wants to join David's podcast again. But I don't know. I'm going to take this year by year by year. Thank you so much, John. I don't have any further questions. There's a lot of comments thanking you for your insightful sure. talk. I also want to say that it was very insightful, incredible again. Great to talk to you. We've learned a lot about the freelance revolution and the challenges and benefits of having flexible workforce. I believe there is a lot happening right now in the minds of executives that are strategizing about the future and how to set up their workforce models in a more flexible way. And as you said, also already, John, in the audience, please contact myself, contact John, wow. get in touch over LinkedIn. We are very happy to, to dive deeper into the topic. And there's a lot to come in the next couple of months and years, for sure. Everyone, I'd like to invite you to follow our Expert Powers LinkedIn page for the next live event that will be up in a couple of weeks. There will be many interesting speakers lined up for you, so don't miss out on that. Would be good to see you. Thanks for tuning in today and have a successful day ahead. Take care and see you soon. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye.